learned correctly. Okay? So the goal at, by the end of today is that you can pronounce every Tibetan syllable perfectly. Okay? If you study this video, like I'm going to do about six weeks of stuff in one day. And then I'll tell you, that's the end of class one, that's the end of class two, that's the end of class three. And then you can go through and do it in classes, but we have to crush it all into one day. Um, what's the point of learning to pronounce everything perfectly? Uh, I'll give you an example. In Tibetan there's a word, uh, there's ka, uh, sorry, ka, say ka, 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 ga, nga, nga, okay? And those are all different. They all have totally different meanings, okay? Kawa means pillar. Kawa means snow. Ka means where or what. Ga means a saddle stirrup or something like that. Nga has another meaning like uh, several. Ga means bliss. Nga means I. And Nga means drum or five or before. Okay? And I'm not kidding. All right? So if you can't distinguish between those sounds by the end of today, uh, you will be like all the other Westerners who ever learned Tibetan. And to them, ga, ka, ka, ga, nga, 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 all sound the same. They all sound the same. So when they're trying to learn a language, think about it. Ten different words sound the same to them. And then when they're reading something, when you read a book, you sound out the words in your mind. And ten of them sound exactly the same. So if there was a thing like the snow from where got stuck in the stirrup, and we were happy, but we had several of them, you know. Kawala, kawa pabne, gala, ka chinso, nga gawo chuns, and ga shi lenso, ani nga nga lenso. You know, those are like ten different, that's a whole story in itself, but to a Westerner it sounds like they're saying, you know, snow, 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 or something like that. You have to be able to distinguish uh, the sounds in Tibetan, and it's no big deal, you know, you see what I mean? It's no big mystery. If you just learn it right the first time, you'll always do it right. Okay? And then your reading will improve like 100%. Suddenly everything makes sense. You see what I mean? And if you don't do that, you'll never be able to read properly. I remember these Germans who say, uh, they can't distinguish between cha and ja. The cheap and jeep are the same thing. You know what I mean? And they have a lot of trouble with jeeps because they say, I'm going to drive in my cheap today or something like that. You know what I mean? Tibetans can't make a distinction between V and F and W and B. Vajra, Vajra, Vajra. You know, it's all the same to them. Uh, so they have trouble with those words. And we have to try to distinguish. We don't have about half of those sounds in English. Half of them we do have. So then you have to be able to distinguish between them. So that's the goal today is to distinguish between those uh, different sounds. And you'll be able to by the end of today. Uh, you won't be able to put it into practice unless you study it and practice it. Um, if you can, you have to learn to speak Tibetan. If you want your scriptural reading to get good, you have to learn to try to speak Tibetan. Colloquial Tibetan has evolved, whereas the written language is frozen. You can pretty much read the Kangyur, spoken 500 BC, the Tengyur, which goes from 200 AD to 800 AD, and the Tibetan commentaries, which start around 850 AD and go to 19... 97, the language is all the same. It's really beautiful. Uh, you can, if you can read one, you can read any of them. And you can almost read a newspaper. You see what I mean? There's another language which is the correspondence language. You know, the language that you use to write letters. That's a wholly different language, completely different. Um, there's a whole honorific system also. Like when you speak to His Holiness, you actually use a different set of words. When you speak to a big lama, you use a different set of words. When you speak to your friends, you use a different set of words. When you speak to children and dogs, I whether that's right or not, uh, <laughs> you use a different set of words. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. That's dying out. Tibetan is not spoken purely anywhere in the world anymore. Uh, in, Ch in Tibet, it's corrupted by the Chinese language. In India, it's corrupted by Hindi. Uh, the, perhaps the last place in the world is the great monasteries in South India. Um, where they still, still speak pretty good Tibetan. Uh, debating is good to learn, if you can, because they mix scriptural language and colloquial language. Like you might say, hey, dumbhead, I'm trying to tell you something, and then you'll quote Nagarjuna, you see what I mean? And uh, 
you get to mix it. You see what I mean? So debating is really good for your language skills. If you can learn to debate, uh, you can learn to read scripture and you can learn to speak. So that's the state of Tibetan right now. Um, I think I heard a statistic where over 50% of Tibetans under 25 write their letters in English now. Uh, so as a spoken language, it's dying. Um, I would say it's probably the damage is already irreparable. I would say, I would guess that if Tibet was gained its, if doesn't, Tibet doesn't gain its independence within 10 or 15 years, it, it'll be like Navajo language or something like that. Um, so hopefully it won't happen. We'll see. Um, okay, so we'll start. The goal of lesson one. Okay, this is lesson one. What do we call it? Um, I'm, I'm doing this partly so that you can learn how to teach it to other people. You see what I mean? I'm going to divide it into lessons so you can learn how to teach it to other people. I haven't taught this for five years. I taught a bunch of people in New York. They do it all the time now. Uh, so anyway, here we go. I hope I remember. Uh, the, the system I'm teaching you uh, came from a very great language scholar named uh, Ngong Tundum Naki. Say Ngong Tundum Naki. Narki. Um, he's still alive. He's the official biography of, of His Holiness. He lives with His Holiness. He writes down every day what he did. He's got 25 volumes done. I don't know if they'll ever publish it. Um, but he's very devoted and he, he writes that. He was trained in the Potala Palace. There were not many schools in Tibet aside from the monasteries. Um, but there was a special school for uh, uh, high administrators in the government, and they would learn to write these beautiful flowery letters. Like, I, I was asked to help translate a, a letter that was written to Truman by His Holiness after the Second World War, congratulating him on winning, and, and it was about this big, and the letters were about this big. And uh, this was the kind of jobs they had to do, you know, official proclamations. And so they were taught grammar very, very strictly, and they had a special little school up in the Patala. Um, then uh, when the Chinese started to take over Tibet, he was sent to Beijing to study. Uh, and he, he studied there very seriously. He learned Chinese. He, he, was, uh, he was a good scholar there. He escaped to India and then was sent to Japan. So he learned Japanese. Uh, and he taught in Japanese universities for a long time. While he was in Japan, I met his father in Dharamsala. His father was named Marlam Changzi. He was a, one of the great aristocrats of Tibet. So, and he taught me to speak Tibetan. Um, then he said, you have to meet my son someday. You know? and, uh, I didn't know. His son turns out to be this great linguist. Then he went to uh, Indiana University, uh, or Ohio, Western, Case Western, and he got a degree, a Western degree in linguistics. So he's really, really good. And uh, he's a really good scholar of, of Tibetan. And he has noticed certain patterns, and he also had the traditional training, which comes from Tumi Sambhota who was one of the only Tibetans who survived the trip to India. I think there were 20-something Tibetans that the king at that time sent to India before the Tibetans had a written alphabet. They didn't have a written alphabet. But when Buddhism started to get big in Tibet, the king said, we need an alphabet. So they assigned like 20 young men to go to India. I think one or two returned. The rest died of tuberculosis and things like that. And uh, that one was Tumi Sambhota. And he wrote uh, a series of great treatises on Tibetan grammar and Tibetan and, and we still have two of those treatises. And so all the Tibetan language study is based on those uh, uh, two, two treatises. Um, so I'm going to teach you this really, really cool system in Lohan who, who really understands the patterns. And this, the neat thing about it is you can learn to, to pronounce everything perfectly within, a, within an, a day if you worked hard at it, but it, within a week or two if you didn't work hard at it, okay? <laughs> Uh, first thing we have to get into the concept of rows and columns, okay, rows and columns. There are 28 consonants in the Tibetan language, uh, or 27 depending on, or 29, big debate, okay, they love to debate these things in Tibet. Basically, s seven rows of letters with four letters in each row, okay? Uh, so I'll show you an example. Uh, we can. You could even draw a thing like this, you see? And then you could draw seven rows. So these are 
columns. Column one, two, three, four. And these are rows A. Well, let's number them one, two, three, four, five. It's easier. One, two. And the goal of, when you're teaching your own students, the goal is to get them through the first five rows in the first day. Okay? That's a good first goal. You'll get them for the, through the first five rows and the first three columns in the first lesson. All right? I don't know what you want to call lesson number one. We'll call it uh, first three columns. How's that? Okay? First three columns. I'm not going to teach you how to draw the letters. I'm not particularly good at it. You can look at, uh, there is a sheet. I don't know if we, do we have that sheet? No. There's a beautiful sheet uh, that somebody did. I don't know, maybe it was a Kagyu group that we used to work with. And I used to teach their language classes. And uh, they had a really nice sheet of how to draw the, the letters. These are like Bhutanese artists who are the best. You know what I mean? And uh, so I'm not going to even attempt to teach you to draw the letters. You can learn. And the thing to remember when you're drawing the letters is, to, is that they were drawn with a bamboo stick and ink, calligraphy, which is called nyuku. The word for Tibet, in Tibetan for pen is, for bamboo is nyuku, and it became the word for pen. Uh, even nowadays, give me an ink pen and give me a nyuku, see? And remember that they cannot do a stroke up. You see, I mean, all the strokes have to go down and over. You see, I mean, they can't reverse a stroke like that. So when you draw a shapki, for example, you know, if you're going to draw a ku, they wouldn't go like this, you see? They would go like, like this. You see, it'd be two strokes. It'd be this and then this. You see what I mean? And you, if you do that, you'll find that your letters come out prettier. They'll look more like Tibetan. Okay. So keep it in mind. Mostly strokes from left to right and down. Uh, when you do a cha, for example, instead of going like this, uh, the real Tibetan way is to go, you see what I mean? Or something like that. It's just two strokes down. I'm not too good at it. You see what I mean? And, and that, that's the general principle. So I'm not, but I'm not going to get into it. And I'm not, my letters aren't beautiful. They're like average, okay? Um, there's also in Tibetan a script, uh, which let's say, Koinchok, would be like this in... Okay. And in script it would be... Uh, And, and I'm not going to teach you that, okay? <laughs> That's a whole other story, but it's good to learn, okay? And after you learn the script, you, you stop using the, this one. This one's called Uchen. Uchen means has a head. Ume means doesn't have a head. And the script is called Ume, and it's called Uchen. There are like three other ways of writing the alphabet. Some for epis, uh, epistolary, uh, for correspondence. And there are some for... Uh, like Lancha script for Sanskrit, Tibetan Sanskrit, and things like that. I'm not even going to get into all that. Okay? We're going to learn the basic Uchen. Okay. By the way, I'm not going to check and see if you're up with me. I'm trucking along, because we have to finish in one day. You'll get lost at some point, and then just enjoy it. Okay? And don't worry about it. Then you can look at the video and figure out what we did. Okay? But uh, you're going to get like 10 classes in one day. Okay? And that's the idea of what we're doing. So don't, don't even get disturbed. Have some coffee or... Relax, you know. Okay. Is that large enough? Yeah.
Uh, the Tibetan alphabet, like Tibetan grammar, is based artificially on the Sanskrit alphabet and on Sanskrit grammar. So the Tibetans to, uh, almost to, what do you call it? To prove that their language was real, they copied Tibetan. And they tried to copy Sanskrit grammar. And it doesn't fit into Tibetan, but they forced it into Tibetan. And so it's really funny, you know, you read some of the Tibetan grammar books and they're just a uh, they're trying to sound like Sanskrit scholars, but they don't need it because Tibetan has like one form where Sanskrit would have 64 forms. Uh, and they'll argue about them, but there's no point to it, you know what I mean? And they're just trying to, I don't know, how do you say it? They're trying to legitimize their language as, you know, almost as good as Sanskrit. It's, it's, <laughs> Sanskrit has 64 conjugations, for example. Tibetan has three. And, and like that, you know, they just, Tibetan has turned out to be an extraordinary language for preserving and transmitting Dharma. But it's not at all like Sanskrit. Sanskrit is extremely precise, has all these conjugations and and declensions. And it, learning Sanskrit is the is the art of learning thousands of declensions and 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 conjugations. That's all. Just endings. There are a thousand basic roots in Sanskrit, and they, you can have a. It's called a generative grammar. You can generate words artificially. You could have a, in fact, they have computers that generate Sanskrit because it's so normal. The, ru the rules are totally normal. Uh, and there's this guy named Panini who came along one time and just said, all the rules are going to be normal. And he wiped out the old Sanskrit and started a new Sanskrit. So Sanskrit is totally normal. Tibetan's not like that at all. English is the worst language in the world, uh, <laughs> seriously, for being abnormal. Uh, but Tibetan's somewhere in between, okay? But it's very, very <coughs> simple. It's like the simplest language that I'm aware of. It was, it was a language of sheep herders and yak herders. And, I mean, that's its roots. And for some reason, it's been able to transmit Dharma very perfectly. Probably because of the karma of the people who are studying it, you see? That's the emptiness of, of a language, okay? Uh, so, the order of the rows copies the order of the Sanskrit alphabet. And the, the order of the Sanskrit alphabet is logical, as Sanskrit so often is. It, the sounds begin in the back of your throat with what we call a, a guttural. Guttural means the sound is made in your throat. It moves up to a palatal. Top of your mouth is your palate. Uh, the, the sound is made there. What do I mean the sound is made there? I mean, you make sounds by closing parts of your mouth and your throat, you know. What part of your m mouth or throat is making contact with another part, okay? Say, ka, ka, it's guttural, it's coming from back, but what's closing is the back of your throat, feel it, ka, ka, that's how you make sounds, okay? Cha, your, your tongue is hitting on the top of your mouth in the back, cha, cha, okay? Here now we have a dental, does dental mean it goes from your teeth? Not really, you don't go like that. Okay? It's behind your teeth, just behind your teeth. Da. Da. Okay. What would you expect next? If you're moving up your mouth, what's left? Your lips, okay? What we call a, a labial. Pa. 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 Then it reverts back to the teeth. Sa. Sa. Okay. One more time. Ka. But if you don't remember the alphabetical order, go back to moving up your throat. You see what I mean? Ka. Guttural. Cha, cha, palatal, ta, dental, pa, labial, sa, back to your teeth, okay? Um, by the way, this doesn't exist in Sanskrit. This is Tibetan. Actually, this one doesn't exist. And this one's up here in Sanskrit, okay? There is no J or CH in Sanskrit. They don't say Raja, they don't say Vajra. There is no J in Sanskrit. It's Radza and Wadzra, and the Tibetans are right, and everyone picks on them. Okay, the Sanskrit scholars pick on them, but they're correct, you know. I mean, the real Sanskritists have figured out that, without knowing what the Tibetans did, independently, that they don't have a Ja or a Cha, and those are all just Western Sanskrit scholars' mistakes, okay? The real pronunciation of, of diamond is, is Wadzra, and the Tibetans are doing it exactly right. King is not Raja, it's Radza. Okay, and chakra, called chakra, is called chakra, and the Tibetans do it right. The Tibetans didn't use this sounds for Sanskrit; they used these because they they heard it and they said that's this. You see what I mean? 
Okay. Uh, each column has its own distinct characteristics, okay? And that's why we're studying the, the alphabet in terms of columns and rows. All of the sounds in the first column, at least for the first five rows, they all have the same principles. They all have the same quality. What? Strong and unaspirated, okay? Strong and unaspirated. I used to say high tone, but it's not really a tone. It's not like, ga, you know, it's just ga, okay? <clears throat> okay, ga. What does unaspirated mean? I'll give you this one, and it'll give you a clue. Say ka. 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 Say cop. 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 Like an American policeman. Cop. That's this one. Ka. Cop. Ka. By the way, English, in language class, you've got to make noise, okay? I used to do this in the Princeton Club with 30 people on the bed. She was there. And the people next door would uh, turn up the football game, you know. Uh, <laughs> say, ka. 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 Say, cop. Ka. Cop. Ka. So we have this sound in English. This sound doesn't exist in English, okay? The unaspirated column doesn't exist in English. We don't get, go around saying, please. Give me a cup of tea and hand me that pen. And that's why Indian people's English is so distinctive. See, they are unaspirating all the aspirates. You see? And if you want to make fun of them, which I never do, um, you can unaspirate all of your words, you know. Give me a cup of tea and hand me that pen. Okay? They're unaspirating all of them. We don't have that in English. We don't have, the un we don't have this column. The first column doesn't exist in English. So all the Westerners pronounce the first column and the second column the same. And you do, you're not going to do that, right? Okay. Say, ka. 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 Okay. Cha. 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 Chop. 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 Cha. 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 Unaspirate doesn't mean you don't breathe at all, obviously. Right? If you didn't, you go, you know, <laughs> you make some aspiration, but you, this is very heavy aspiration, a lot of air coming out. Cha. 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 If you listen carefully, there's also a difference in the value of the vowel, which means this is more of an uh sound, and this is more of an ah sound. Listen to it again. Cha. Cha. It's uh, ah, uh, uh, ah. Uh. And in fact, that's the difference in Sanskrit between a short A and a long A. You see what I mean? Shastra and Shastra. Shastra and Shastra. Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna. You don't say Nagarjuna. You see what I mean? But Western scholars can't even pronounce it right. So, no difference. Shastra and Shastra are two totally different words. And they, they never got it straight. You get it? That's, the, that's why you have a long A in Sanskrit. This is the short A. Uh. This is the long A. Ah. Cha, 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 cha. Okay. One more time. Cha, cha, cha. Okay. I think it's a pattern. I don't know if Tumi Sambora did it on purpose. But it seems like the aspirated column has these closed things, shapes. You know, here it's mostly open. You see what I mean? It's almost as if he said, look, when I close it up, make more air or something. I don't know. It seems to be a pattern. Look at this one. You see what I mean? It's got all these closed shapes uh, for the aspirated. So if you don't remember, you might try that. Okay, these are all open. Okay, so say ka, ka, cha, cha, ta, ta, pa, pa. Okay, that's all. Um, if you want to drive a Tibetan teacher crazy, uh, pronounce this column like this column. You know, takpa. Mitakpa, you know, for impermanent and permanent. Takpa, mitakpa. Takpa means tie me up, you know. <laughs> He's going, oh, don't do that, you know. I mean, we have people in New Jersey for 20 years have not got this straight, you know. And it drives the Lama crazy, you know. Uh, okay, here's the next one. By the way, this little thing here is called a tzahak. 
Tzalak. Say Tzalak. Tzalak. A little flag here that distinguishes this one from this one. You see what I mean? That's the only difference. Is this little flag. And really it's a little S shape here. I mean, when, it, when you do it... Say Ka. Ka. Cha. Cha. Ta. Ta. Pa. Pa. Ta. Ta. Okay? That's good. You got it. Okay. When you teach it to somebody, you do the Ka Cha Ta. Ready? She likes that one, right? She learned this long ago. Say Ka. Cha. Ta. Pa. Ta. Ka. Cha. Ta. Pa. Ta. Kacha, tapa, sa. Kacha, tapa, sa. Kacha, tapa, sa. Kacha, tapa, sa. You can learn the first half of the Tibetan alphabet just like that. Kacha, tapa, sa. Kacha, tapa, sa. Kacha, tapa, sa. Kacha, tapa, sa. It's like gacha, you know, like it's going up your throat. Okay, gacha tabatsa, kacha tabatsa. That's all. And then you see, you can memorize it like that, and all first three columns are the same, which is cool. Uh, this column, third column, keep to that kachitabatsa pattern. Okay? We do not have the third column in English. What distinguishes a Westerner who learns Tibetan well from a Westerner who doesn't learn Tibetan well is how they mangle the third column or not. Okay? <laughs> All right. So, try to do it right. Okay? Uh, I call it the Brazil, the Brazil phenomenon. Okay, I used to go to Brazil a lot on business. Uh, there's diamond uh, companies there and gemstone companies, and uh, we would. Uh, when you get to Rio, there's this very famous lady, and she's known all over the country. She's a national celebrity who does the announcements for the flights uh, in the airport, and I'll try to imitate her, but I'm not very good at it. Okay, it's like. Flight number <laughs> four, four, five. <laughs> you know, it's leaving for Kennedy Airport. You know, and, and she's like really famous, you know, and, and all the other ladies have to do it her way. Uh, but it's this, you can think of it as a sexy sound, okay? It's like, mmm. Okay? It's like that. Really, and I'm not kidding. It goes, mmm. Okay? Try it. Mm. <laughs> and it's really like that. I'm not kidding. Okay, it, it's a little bit of a, it's voiced. It's called a voice. Voice means your voice box buzzes. If you touch here and you go, mm. okay. <laughs> All right. mm. and we don't have that in English. Okay, I mean we have voiced consonants, but, but this is cr this is voiced. You're going to get to a non-voiced one later. Okay, and now you'll see the difference. These you have to make a humming sound in your throat. And you have to drop off at the end. Okay, I'll give you an example. Ka. Ka. See, flight number <laughs> four, four, five. Okay, ka. ka. And when my when I'm reading with my students, I'll just say Brazil, and <laughs> and they'll remember. You know, uh, I used to say sexy, but it's not too appropriate. So, ka. ka. See, ka. 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 Okay. Cha. 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 <laughs> Don't get excited, okay. Uh, ta. 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 By the way, your voice should crack because you're not used to it, you see? If you're making a Tibetan sound correctly that we don't have in English, you, it should be hard. It should be unnatural. It should feel unnatural. 
So if it feels unnatural, you're doing it right. And then it will, you'll learn it. If it feels natural, you're doing it wrong. That's a general rule of thumb from the third column. You should be like, <coughs> pa. <laughs> Say, pa. 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 Tsa. Tsa. Notice the pattern? Ka. Ka. Cha. Cha. Ta. Ta. Pa. Pa. Tsa. Tsa. Ka. Ka. Cha. Cha. Ta. Ta. Pa. Pa. Tsa. Tsa. Same rule. You can learn half of the Tibetan alphabet in 10 minutes. You see what I mean? If you know this system. And you just did it. There's 28 consonants, you just learned 15. More than half. We'll go over the three columns again. Ka. Cha. Ta. Pa. Tsa. Ka. Cha. Ta. Pa. Tsa. Go to Brazil. Ka. Cha. Ta. Pa. Tsa. Okay. Ka. Cha. Ta. Pa. Tsa. Ka. Cha. Ta. Pa. Tsa. Ka. Cha. Ta. Pa. Tsa. Okay. That's all. And if you want to drive your students crazy, after you go through that, go through the room and say one of the columns and see if they get it right. Okay, you ready? Tell me what column this is. Ka cha ta pa cha. Okay. Ka cha ta pa cha. Kap chop top pop top. Pizza. Yeah, second column. Uh, this is gonna be easy. Ka cha ta pa cha. Okay. Ka cha ta pa cha. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Would you normally do the letters in column three or the sounds in column three so slow when you're speaking? How would they sound in? Uh, no, not at all. I'm I'm exaggerating. Uh, if you ask a Tibetan if there's this thing, they'll say, "I don't know what you're talking about. I never heard of that." You see? And but if you listen carefully, that's what they're doing. Kiran kaba dogiuri, kaba ka kaba. Kaba means where. Okay, kaba. They wouldn't say ka ba. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll do normal speed. Kawa kawa kaba. Kawa kawa kaba. Okay. You hear? That's the first three columns. Kawa kaba. Sorry. Kawa kawa kaba. You see. And if you ask them about this stuff, they'll say no, unless they're like a, a really well-trained linguist, which there's only like two or three in the whole country. Okay. Um, so that's the first three columns. That's where I would normally stop the first class, and I'd say, go home, you learn to write them yourself. It's not my problem. You know? <laughs> but I always tell a student when I start them on this, you must learn instant recognition. In the next week, before you come back to this class, you must have some, get some note cards, draw a letter on the front. On the back, you draw whatever you want. By the way, this is where the fights about how to transliterate Tibetan come from. Because this column doesn't exist in English. And this column doesn't exist in English. So Jeffrey Hawkins will swear it's, it's knock with a K or knock with a G and somebody else, no, 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 it's K with a G and not with a K, but a K-H, no, it's on K-H, no, G, no, K. The reason being they don't exist, okay? They don't exist in English. You can fight about it all day long. They are somewhere between a G and a K. And people will fight forever, because there is no English, okay? The only sound in English is this one. K, cha, t. And people like my poor root lama get stuck with farchin for the rest of their life. Fardo, you know, thupten. Uh, why? And I really beg you to learn the difference, okay? When you write transcription of Tibetan. You're trying to show Tibetan exact spelling in English letters. You have to use different tricks. Like for just for no reason at all except for convenience, we use this for ta, we use this for ta, and we use this for ta. Does it mean that they sound like that? Not at all. Okay? And people never get it straight, you know, for You'll, you'll read pujas, you'll read things from all different dharma centers, you'll see names of dharma centers. Poor Supa Rinpoche. You see? The Z is only for transliteration, it's not for pronunciation. And he's stuck with Zappa for the rest of his life, you know? 
it's a mistake. My Lama's name was spelled wrong by the people who did his passport. It's Tarchin, you know. Get it straight. This is only for purposes of spelling them in English letters and getting the transcription right. Nothing to do with pronunciation. You see what I mean? So does everyone spell it that way? Many, many people make this mistake. Many, many people, even scholars after 20 years, are confusing pronunciation from transliteration. You see what I mean? Transliteration means, this is how we distinguish them if you're typing 120,000 pages into the computer so that you can search for them correctly. But pronunciation is just what's the closest sound in our language. You see what I mean? And you are going to have a T for both of these. In pronunciation, in transliteration, you have to distinguish between them, and so you use an H. It's not like you go, paha here, right? You see what I mean? This is the transliteration, but not the pronunciation. And people never get it straight. Yeah. So when you teach and you write the English underneath, you're doing pronunciation. You're not of course. Doing yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. If I did, if, like Kyamdo, right? Going for refuge. Here's the transliteration. Okay? Skyabs gro. Skyabs hagro. That's transliteration. The modern pronunciation of this word in Central Tibetan dialect, which is what I. is kyamdro. Okay? So if you're teaching a class and you're trying to get them to make the closest sound, which one are you going to write? <laughs> okay? <laughs> But people get confused, even great scholars, even advanced scholars, they start, they get confused between these two. They don't make the distinction between transliteration and pronunciation in central Tibetan dialect. If you're studying with a Nyingma Lama or a Kagyu Lama, Kaju, sorry, they'll say cham, Chamdo. Because that's their accent. That's the way they speak Tibetan. Okay? And their students come up and talk to you like that. <laughs> and they swear that's how Tibetan should be pronounced. But we are taking central dialect, which is understood by everybody in the country, although not spoken by everybody in the country. Okay? We're taking central dialect, which happens to be the dialect of the Galupas. So, all right. Uh, why? There were these political problems and all the Kagis and Nyingmas were pushed out to the east. And they ended up all talking like that. If you meet a Kagyu or a Nyingma Lama, they're very likely, and I'm not disparaging them, I'm just saying, because of political events that happened long, long, long ago, they're more likely to speak a, a local dialect. Uh, and it, you might get confused, Jamso for Gyatso, you see, ocean. Uh, so don't get confused if you hear that, Kanjur instead of Kangyur. For the, uh, and the first Western scholars came in through China. So they spelled the, tang the Tengyur and the Kangyur as Tenjur and Kanjur, because they ran into, they ran into that dialect. They come up from the style. Okay? <laughs> so we have to clean up those things. I mean, it should be a standard central Tibet Utsang, U, 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 which means central uh, dialect, is the one that, that I teach. It's the one that's spoken in the major mon uh, Galupa monastic uh, institutions in the country. And it's understood by everyone in the country. Okay, it's the language of the Tibetan government. Um, I'm not saying it should be the only language, but I'm saying that's, a, that's one that's good to learn because everyone will understand you. If you, under, if you s learn to speak Tibetan from a Kamba or somebody, somebody, somebody from Amdo, uh, other people may not be able to understand you at all. Like we have debating in the monastery, we get some new kids from Chone and Amdo or Kam. I've seen this in the winter debates. You know, the, they're defending themselves, they have their yellow hats on, they're representing their college, you know, and Sarah J comes up, bam, you know, and then they give their answer, you know, and everybody's going, you know, and they say, uh, what'd you say, you know, this is in front of 3,000 monks, you know, what'd you say, he says, well, I got my answer, you know, and you're like, could you speak Tibetan, you know, and, and you get in these big fights, and sometimes they just give up, they said, look, go home and learn, ooh, okay, go home and learn to talk, and then come back, you see what I mean, uh, you can't, you literally can't understand them. There are some dialects out in East, like Girong, Iskaputi Kalat, Kirumuchi Kirkyuk Gyakyan, you know, nothing to, there's no Tibetan in there at all. It's a whole different language. Uh, and then they come to the monastery and they, 
they get made fun of for a few weeks and then they change. <laughs> okay. Um, by the way, in Ladakh and in Mongolia, they might say skipgro, skipgro, okay, skipgro, going for refuge, gamdro. They'll say skipgro. They are right. You see, language evolves faster at the center of a civilization, and out in the boondocks, it doesn't change much. Ladakh is the boondocks of Tibetan culture. Mongolia is the other boondocks, and they still say. A skip scroll or something like that. You will hear like that. If you try to speak to a Ladakhi, they'll, they'll say skip scroll. Uh, someone from Gyeron was for Chi, which is spelled Spi, they'll say Spi. Okay. Um, but we're doing Central Tibetan dialect. How did I get onto that? Oh, so now you see the difference between pronunciation and transliteration. And I beg you, please don't confuse them. Okay. And don't get in big fights about whether this is K or G, because the answer is neither. It's between, and you can fight about it all day, and you won't, you won't decide. Okay. I, I, I wrote out the rules for, that we use for pronunciation, and you can see it someday. I wrote out the justification for, the, for what I use. Um, and I don't care what you use, but you should be consistent. That's the trick. Be consistent with what you do. And don't confuse transliteration with pronunciation. Okay. All right. Why did I get onto that subject, which is so dear to my heart? Uh, when you do your note cards, have this thing on the front, and what you put on the back is your business. I don't care. Because there is no English equivalent. You see what I mean? You put on the back what makes you sound it the closest. Ka. But, go, but when you teach your students, and when you review this tape, stop here, go home, make 15 flashcards, Put, put the sound that you hear on the back, okay? And I don't care what you write, as long as you make the sound right, okay? And, and do them constantly. The students I have who have learned Tibetan the best busted their ass on the first two classes. You see what I mean? And forever after, the ones who didn't have recognition problems, you see what I mean? They're always like, is that first column or second column? You know? You know, I hate that question, by the way. You know, I'm saying ka. Don't ask me if it's first column or second column. Okay? I didn't say ka. Okay? I mean, if you want to get me mad, uh, say, oh, is that first column or second column? It's ka. Okay? Not ka. Oh, oh okay, okay. All right. That's all. Uh, you should stop your first class there okay? when you teach somebody and tell them, you go home, you make yourself 15 flashcards. You write on the back of it whatever sound you hear. I don't care. But you don't come back until you have instant recognition. Like, I'm going to point to a letter, and you're going to pronounce it perfectly. Okay? And then you send them home. All right? Lesson two. By the way, again, don't get discouraged. We're zooming through the whole six weeks course. and You can look back at the tape and remember what it was about. Okay, we'll call it nasals, etc. Rest of alphabet. <laughs> okay, not nasal drip, nasals. It says nasals, etc. Rest of alphabet. Okay, this is my Urdu handwriting. Okay. I know, I know. By the way, I didn't give you my pitch for learning Tibetan. There's two hundred thousand Tibetan commentaries. Two hundred thousand. About 50 have been translated into English. About five, well. Okay? And about two, authority. <laughs> I don't know. I just broke a bunch of bodhisattva bells. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you'll never know unless you learn Tibetan how bad they are. <laughs> okay? But uh, you have to learn Tibetan. At this stage, in 100 years from now, it probably won't matter, or 200 years from now, it won't matter. You are first generation. You are the transition generation. You have to learn Tibetan. And there's no experience like surfing through that, that information. There's nothing like it. I s used to surf for years. I went to Hawaii and surfed there. Really, really wonderful. I dream about it still. 
uh, it feels just the same. It really does feel the same. And you're like, pew, 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 pew. you know, you're like <laughs> getting tubed on this. Uh, and you go through like Donglin, that whole notebook was like two hours on the computer, you know. And here is like a really authoritative, first time ever presented this way from hundreds and hundreds of years of scripture. And you just can put it together like that. Uh, and you'll never know if you don't learn Tibetan. And in your lifetime and in my lifetime, it's not going to be translated. No way. Unless you do it. You know, how much can I do? Three or four more? Uh, it, it, it has to spread to other people. Like, you have to go to Italy and you. <laughs> okay, etc. <cetera. laughs> okay. <laughs> don't come home without it. All right. Uh, nasals. It's our responsibility. I mean, whether the lineage is purely, you know, transformed into a Western vernacular depends totally on us. There's, nobody else is going to do it. And there will not be highly trained Tibetan lamas for very long. I don't think so. You know, if it wasn't for the repression in Tibet, those monasteries would be empty. There are no kids coming from India. You see what I mean? There are very, very few kids coming in from India. The parents are not putting them in the monastery. They think it's a waste of time. And if it wasn't for the Chinese re refusing them religion, I don't think they'd be interested. You know, if they opened it up and said, you can do as much Buddhism as you want, they wouldn't come to India. You see, it's because they get denied religion that they come to India. Um, and unwisely, the, the, the Chinese are saying, Sarah Monastery, which had uh, 6,000 monks in the old days, the limit is 50 monks now. They're not allowing more than 50 monks in Sarah Monastery. You know, and they get beat up every, you know, who wants to be a monk at Sarah? It's like a, it's like a ticket to get beat up every six weeks, every time they have some problem. They come and beat up everybody. So, you know, what's the, if it, if it wasn't for that, the, the monasteries, I'm saying don't think there's someone in the world holding this lineage. There's not. You know, don't think there's hundreds of lamas over in India holding these things. There's not. Trust me. In Sarah May, there's one Vinaya teacher left. You know, there's, four scripture teachers left. There's nobody under 60. You see what I mean? There's maybe... Wh where do they go? Australia. To teach Lam Rim to 10 people. You see what I mean? And frankly, they're, giant, they're sucking out the talent from the monastery. There aren't any scripture teachers that... The, the younger ones are all gone. Um, and they don't develop. They don't, they don't develop further and they don't teach Tibetan monks. There's a, there's a very serious problem in the monasteries right now. Okay. I think they should train them and say you have to stay for 10 years or something like that. But, uh, you know, here we go in the nasal. Don't think it's being kept somewhere else. If, we, if anybody's going to keep it, it's probably you guys. It can be a scary thought, right? <laughs> No, if you don't work hard, it's going to be lost. Mm -hmm. A lot has been lost already. Uh, nasal means all these sounds are like you probably hold your nose, okay? That's a nasal, okay? These are all nasals. Fourth column is nasals. Saying, uh, no. by the way, make them low. The only thing you have to remember with the fourth column, they are nasal and they are low. For example, you don't say nga, you say nga. Say, I'll give you the difference. Nga. Nga. Let's do an easier one. Na. 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 Hear the difference? Na. Na. Okay? Strong, high, and then low tone. When you say the fourth column, say it low has to be low. If you say it high, it changes meaning totally. Nga means I. Nga means drum. Nya means fish. Nya means like famous. Na means if. Na means nose. Ma means mommy. Ma means a wound. You see what I mean? Uh, keep them down low. Okay? Say nga. Nga. Nya. Nya. Na. Nya. Ma. Ma. Okay? Notice a pattern? Nga. Uh -huh. Nya. Yeah. Na. Ma. It's still coming up your throat. It's this brilliant Sanskrit thing. Now, I used to have trouble with this one, so I'm going to... When you teach your students, give it a little extra attention. 
I remember distinctly walking to the library in Dharamsala in my first few weeks and going, you know, <laughs> you know I remember struggling with this one. Uh, what will happen is people will make it a palatal or a dental, and it won't be a gut, a gut really. See, it has to come from here. It comes from the back of your throat closing. So if people are having trouble with it, like I guess 20% of Americans have trouble with this one. I tell them, hold on to your tongue. And nga, 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 nga. If you want to mispronounce it, let your tongue hit the top of your mouth. Nya or na. It's not that. If you tell them, hang on to your tongue. Nga, 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 nga. Okay? All right? If they still have trouble, I trick them. There's a tub K. What's tub K mean? Yeah, skillful means, which in English is just like a trick to get somebody to do something right. It just, that's what tap kepo means. We call it skillful means, but really in English, in, in colloquial English, it's like, here's the way I trick him into doing it right. <laughs> By the way, we don't have in English na as an initial sound. We don't have it. We just don't have it. You know, those poor guys who come to America named Ngawang always get, end up Ngawang because my, my Ngawang works and started out in Wendy's. And they're like, Gah, Gah. he said, how about Ngawang? Oh, Ngawang, okay, you know, poor guy, he's Ngawang for the rest of his life, you know. Right. We don't have it as an initial, meaning as, a, as the beginning of a word. Like they have it in Vietnamese, right? And I remember when, during the war, I was like trying to say Mu Yin Bu and stuff like that. I was trying to get ready in case I had to go, you know? Uh, say, ring a bell. Ring a bell. Ring a, this is the way to trick somebody into doing it right. Ring a bell. Ring a bell. Ring a bell. Cut the R. Ing a bell. Ing a bell. Ing a bell. Ing a bell. You know what I'm going to do. Ng a bell. Ng a bell. Ng a bell. Ng a bell. And that's how you trick somebody into it. If they can't get it, there's a certain, there's a one or two percent of Americans who just can't get it. It's like, nya, nya, nya. They're like shooting you, you know, like, nya, no, no, nya, no, no, no. You know? <laughs> okay. So you, then you give them the ring a bell thing, okay? Ring a bell, ring a bell, ring a bell. Then go, ing a bell, ing a bell, ing a bell. Then go, ng a bell, ng a bell, ng a bell. And then they get it right, okay? Same with this one, frankly. We only have one English word that starts with tsar that I can think of, which is tsar, which is a Russian word, right? Tsar. And I used to just tell them pizza without the P. You see what I mean? Pizza, pizza, and then itza, itza, and then tsa, tsa, okay? I used to teach them it's a boy, you know. Did you have a kid? Yeah, it's a boy. It's a boy. It's a boy. It's a boy. Drop the I. Tsa, tsa, tsa. You see, and that's how you trick them into doing sa. Some people have problem with sa. Okay. Um, rest of alphabet means that's the end of the party as far as things being normal. Okay. <laughs> like you get kachatabatsa, 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 and then na nya na ma. Still following this pattern up your throat. Then it breaks the rules. Say wa. wa. Low tone, okay? Wa. Low tone, normal, wa. 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 Okay, that's all. There's only one native Tibetan word, which is probably a Chinese word anyway, which is fox, that uses this. There's an instrument called a piwang. And now there's hundreds of loan words from Chinese in Tibet, you know, using wa. But in classical Tibetan, there's, you're only going to see about three or four words with wa. In other words, you won't recognize this the first three times you see it. You'll have to look it up again and you say, oh yeah, wow, well, I remember that one. Okay. Um, there is another wa sound in Tibetan and we'll get to it later. Okay. Now, row number six.
It's written ka 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 nga, cha 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 nya, ta 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 na, pa 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 ma, and it goes like that. Okay, remember that. Okay. How to use a dictionary? If we'll have time, we'll do it today. You know, because that's a little tricky in Tibetan. Say sha. sha. By the way, here are the characteristics of the row hang together, right? Up here it was the columns were hanging together. These were all strong and unaspirated. First column. Second column was all aspirated. The third column was all voiced. The fourth column was all nasal. Now forget columns were working by row. Okay? The fifth the quality of the sixth row, all low tone. All low tone. Okay. If you make them higher, you'll screw up because we have another row coming later of the higher ones. Okay? So here we go. Sha. Sha. Sa. Sa. Ha. Ha. Ya. Ya. Sha. Sha. Sa. Sa. A. A. Ya. Ya. That's all. Okay, all low tone. How do you spell the pronunciation of this first one? You tell me. The closest English sound. Sha. Sha Viran. S-H-A. Okay. Spell this one for me. Sa. No. Sa. No. Sa. I'm sobbing all day. Sa. It's just S. Yeah, it's S-A, okay? It's an S. Sa. Sabina. Okay, something like that. Sorry. Okay, sa. That's all. What's the transcription of these two? Transliteration. Sha. You see? When you want to show someone the spelling, you use these. Why? Because we have another set of S H and S that have already been reserved. Okay. So poor Lama Saba which is S, gets called Zopa for the rest of his life, you know, because someone has confused transliteration with pronunciation, okay what I mean? Um, but you're not going to do that, and you won't go around creating thuptans, right? Promise me? <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there's no reason for that, you see? There's, there's, no, there's no case in the English language where TH is not pronounced THA. And I don't know why they do that. It's just they don't understand this difference, you see. Okay. Uh, row number seven. I will. I have a really hard time to draw these figures. I've never drawn them. Um, doesn't matter at all. You go home and keep drawing them and show them to some neutral party and say, does that look like the one in the book? And they'll say no, and then you've got to work on it a little harder. But you don't need me to check your drawing. You see what I mean? It's just drawing a sh an outline of something. And uh, there's a, a, we have something. We've got to dig it out, so we'll make a course out of this thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's an order of the strokes. There's a, there's a nice uh, chart that has each letter and tells you the order of the strokes. That's perfect. That's great. That one. If you could copy that for people. The dog's picture at the end of each letter that I'm going to talk about it. Okay. Here goes the sixth row again. Sha. Sha. Sa. Sa. Ha. Ha. By the way, not ha. Okay? Not ha. It's just an A sound without an H in front of it. Ah. Uh. Ya. Yeah. Yeah. What's the characteristic of the sixth row? The only thing you can say is that they're all low. Okay? What can you say about the seventh row? Seventh row is all mid-tone, mid-tone. And that distinguishes the seventh row from the sixth row. Ready? Ra, ra, la, la, sha, sha, sa. sa. Ra, ra, la, la, sha, sha, sa. sa. Couple of things to say about this. The ra is rolled, and I'm not too good at it, okay? There's two ways to make an R sound in English. One is by putting the, the front teeth on the bottom lip ripped up the paper. Ra. You see? Ra. You know? Think about it. Say anything with R in it, you know, roach, roach, or something like that. You know, really nice. 
really nice. Well, you see what I mean? It's your front teeth on your lip, on the back of your lip. Well, that's not how an R is made in Tibetan. It's always a tongue on the palate rolling. Ra, 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 okay. ra. You'll sound better pronouncing Tibetan if you roll it from the palate. Ra, ra. Okay. Say ra, la, sha, sa. Get this. Sha. 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 Sa. 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 What's the pronunciation? I'll say it again. Sha. How do you spell it? Pronunciation. S H A. Pronunciation. Sha. S H A. Please. Okay. In pronunciation, the closest English equivalent is the same. We don't have a sha. Transcription, please. Z H A. And, and in order to distinguish it for orthographic purposes, for spelling, this one, S-H-A. S-H-A. You see what I mean? The pronunciation, the closest English sound is the same spelling. When you spell out the word in a computer so you can search it properly, you distinguish between them artificially as by putting a Z here and an S here. But that doesn't mean you go calling people Zopa or something like that, okay? Same thing here. Uh, pronunciation? Sa. Sa. Nearest English sound? Nearest English sound? Yeah, S-A. Sa. Nearest English sound? S-A. Don't worry about it. That's the way it is. Okay? Transliteration. Z-A, for, just for spelling purposes. Transliteration? S-A. And different scholars have struggled with this. You know, they said, let's call them both S-A, and uh, we'll put a line under it, or we'll put a dot over it, or we'll make a little thing like that, or maybe we'll make a thing like that. And you can't, that can't, right now, that doesn't go over the internet, it doesn't go over the wire, it's not in ASCII code. It's stupid to do that for purposes of the modern world. You can't give it to other people. And the systems which use that, when you get an email from them, you have like some smiley face there, and you're like, I wonder what that was before they emailed it to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't need diacritical marks in Tibetan. You don't need them. You see? They're unnecessary. It's stupid. And the Library of Congress and other people are still trying to do it that way. And when you call the Library of Congress on your computer, and search their catalog, when you hit that, when you, you can look for Ngawang, Nyawang, Nawang, it's all N-A. Because the diacritic doesn't travel over the wire, which is really stupid. And that's the way they're doing it. And they, they're still trying to do it that way. You don't need them in, in, in Tibetan. Yeah. Is the difference in the vowel pronunciation the Yeah, it is, and you can't really reflect that in the, in the English sound. You see what I mean? I tried, I used to try. I used to try to use U for the uh, but then I didn't have anything to use for the oo, so I used to use a double O, and that really confused people. Because our uh sound is spelled with so many different vowels. So it is. It really is. Cup is spelled with a U, you know. Uh, I believe that in normal pronunciation, you're going to have to reserve the U for oo sound, which means you're not going to be able to distinguish between an ah uh and an uh. You're going to have to use A for both of them. Okay. And that's the way it is. Or you can start adding diacritics that people don't know what they mean. Or you can start putting a long s sign, which even modern Sanskrit scholars, none of them pronounce correctly. What's the point? People are going to pronounce it dhar dharma anyway. They're not going to say dharma. And they're not going to say dharma or dharma. You know, they're going to say dharma. So, okay, put in all these marks, but they're doomed. They will die. Evolution of languages. That which is easy survives. That which is complicated dies. <laughs> if you're going to translate, get it. Put in those Sanskrit words, put in those Tibetan words, put in those weird diacritical marks, you're dooming your translation. People won't read it in 10 years. I know. I got books like that. <laughs> Make it accessible to people, uh, and that'll survive. And if you want to doom your work, if you want to send it to the garbage, you know, in 10 years. If you want to, like, project it to the garbage, you know, 
then put in a bunch of weird stuff, you know, diacritical marks, put in as much Sanskrit in there as you can, you know, make it weird, use a bunch of weird words that are not common English, and you're dooming it. People won't use it in 10 years. Your whole life will be wasted. You know, it's evolution of what is clear. The clear things survive and the, the confusing things die. You know, there's a guy named Gunther who had a, a way of translating. It's dead. Those books aren't even reprinted anymore. Uh, Goldstein's first books, uh, La Lumba's first books. You don't even know these guys because they're so weird. The pronunciation thing was so complicated that it died already. Nobody wants to use it. Okay. If you want to doom your work, then make it... People will think you're really scholarly and, and it will die in 10 years. And, and it'll be gone, and it won't help anybody. Okay. Um, that's the difference between these sounds. Say again. Low tone and high tone. Watch. Sha. 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 If you ask a Tibetan to pronounce this, you won't hear that much difference. You see, they'll say sha, 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 sha. And they may not even be able to tell you what they're doing. If you ever tried to go teach English to someone, you quickly learn that Someone from their culture who knows English well can teach them better because they're sensitive to the, to the problems. You see, I mean, learning to teach English as a second language takes a lot of skill. The same with Tibetan. The great Tibetan grammarians are the Mongols because they had to learn Tibetan. <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> really, some of the greatest tantric works for Naam Belden and other authors, they're all Mongols. You know, Nam Kapel, uh, the the Lojong text is about the rays of the sunlight and things like that. These are the, some of the greatest scholars were foreigners who had to struggle with these things. You see what I mean? Say sha, 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 sa, 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 sa. Okay, one more. Eight is only half a row. Say ha, 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 ah, ha, 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 ah, ha. okay? There's a big debate, raging debate in Tibetan grammar for the last 1,100 years. <laughs> Is this a vowel or a consonant? You know, I mean, anyway, it's, one, it's listed as a consonant. I think you're going to have to teach your students the difference between this one, this one, and this one, okay? Because they're all similar. What's the distinguishing quality of this row? Low tone. Ah, ah, ah. Okay. Uh, no H sound in front of it. You don't go ha. Okay. It's just ah. This one, medium sound. Ah, 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 ah. This is the most natural sound in the world. This is the primordial ah. You know, like ama in Tibetan means what? Mami. I mean, the, the, main, the first word that everyone had learned, you know, ah, ma, okay, oh, ma, hum, you see? Ah, say ah, 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 ha. You see, this has an H in front of it. Ha, ah, ah, ha, ah, ah. That's all. You have to teach your students to distinguish between those three. These are medium tone. This one has an H in front of it, this one doesn't. Ha, ah, uh, ha, ah. Uh. And its cousin over there is ah. Uh. Ha, ah, uh, ah. Uh. That's all. Um, that's the end of the second class. You send them home. You say, don't come back till you can uh, instant recognition, demand instant recognition of them. If they come back and they can't, you take your flashcards and you say, give me your flashcards. If they say they don't have any, you can send them home already. Okay? If they give you these beaten up things with subway grease all over them, you know they've been working hard, you know? And then you start flipping them at them, okay? You know, this one, this one, this one, this one. Do it fast, you know? Make them, put them through their hoops, you know? Is that what you're saying? Anyway, instant recognition. Within the first two classes, before you go on to the third class, they must have instant recognition. Okay. Otherwise, there's no point. They will always, forever struggle. 
if they don't get over that. You know, they must have total, quick, instant recognition of any letter. And don't take them to, don't allow them to have a third class until they get it, you know, like that. Because you're just doing them a disservice. They'll go on and they'll always be, they'll always hesitate at this letter, you know. If, pa, pa, oh, I, I don't remember, you know. Don't let them go on until they get that one straight. Could you repeat the last row? Last column or last row? Last column. Yeah. Column four only holds up to here, okay? Na. Na. Nya. 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 Na. Na. Ma. Ma. About 5% of Westerners have a problem with this one. And I just teach them, nya, 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 nya. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right? That's exactly what it is. And that's about the only time it comes in English. It comes in Spanish with señor, cañón. Okay? Nya. Nya. It's the tilde. Okay? Nya. A couple of, you know, some Westerners confuse these two. You know, this is na, this is nya, this is nya, 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 nya. This is not, na, okay, na, that's all. This one is hard for a lot of foreigners, and most commonly they will try to palatalize it into nya or na, and you say, ah, uh -uh, get your tongue out of there, hold your tongue. Na, na, na. You should be able to do it even with your tongue out of, out of commission, you know, na, na, na. Because it's a closure in the throat. La, la, la. If they don't get it straight, do the ring a bell. Trick them into it. Okay. That's the end of the second class. I suggest everybody go get a coffee, and we'll drink coffee while we're working, okay? Special. This is going to be informal. Take five minutes and get some coffee, and then come back. The last column, the last two letters. <coughs> yeah. Uh, ha? No, the, no, the last column. These two? Yeah. These two. Yeah, we stop going columns when we get to number four. You see? The column stuff, by the way, ends here. Got it? The usefulness of teaching somebody in columns stops there. These all hang together. These all hang together. These all hang together. These all hang together. And then stop teaching it by column. You see what I mean? Those two look the same, though. The last column four six and column four seven. Which these two letters you mean? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll show you the difference. I'm gonna wipe this out. Okay. Ya yeah is written like by the way, the Sanskrit was uh, you see what I mean? And then the Tibetan <laughs> became Okay. And then this one is uh, Zoro. Okay. Um, this is Sanskrit. Okay, don't don't learn that. By the way, you should tell them by this. This is called a tsek. Say tsek. Tsek. Tsek means that dot. Okay. The dot is used to dis to stop a syllable. Okay. The dot is used to stop a syllable. Do we have anything in English that corresponds to the dot? Right, in the dictionary we do. But not in, the space is not the same as the dot. You see, you don't say consciousness. You see what I mean? Oh, those are, those are three syllables. In Tibetan there would have been a tsek, which causes a lot of problems because in a line of Tibetan, you don't know where the word starts and where the word ends. If you think that's bad, look at Sanskrit that doesn't even have a syllable divider. You can have a, a line of Sanskrit that doesn't have any separation between the words or the syllables. It'll, it just goes on. You know what I mean? And then you get these huge fights about where should we break the word. Because sometimes it's ambiguous. You see? Uh, so that's the purpose of a tsek. And we'll get into... Uh, remind me to do punctuation marks, okay? Uh, go grab a coffee and come back real quick. Don't, don't like, talk. Come back and have some. Right, class three was uh, Six, nasals and the rest of the alphabet. This is how you're going to teach it to people. Don't let them come back from their class unless they have instant recognition. You're not helping them. Send them back home. Seriously. Because you're just, if they get sloppy, they have to bust ass for the first four or five classes. Then after that, they can slough off. But, but if they don't have instant recognition, you're not helping them by going on. Okay. 
Okay, class three is the vowels and head letters. There are five vowel sounds in Tibetan. Five vowels. One of them we call the natural ah sound. Every Tibetan consonant has its own internal natural ah sound. You don't have to draw any other vowel. If you see a Tibetan letter without any vowel on it, you assume the sound is ah. You see what I mean? You assume that the vowel sound is ah. This is ka. We don't have to have a separate vowel like to tie down here, you know, or something like that. We don't need that. Every Tibetan consonant has its own natural ah sound. So there is no separate vowel sign for ah. Yeah, it is the last letter of the alphabet. You see? It's that sound is inherent in every Tibetan consonant. Luckily, in Tibetan, the name of every letter is its sound, which is not the case with English. English. A, B, C, D, E, F, E? No. G, <laughs> He? No. English is bizarre, okay? Uh, luckily, the sound of every Tibetan letter is its name, okay? Uh, so that's Ka. Now I'll give you the order of the... This is... By the way, stroke like this, right? Down and then... You see, if you go like this, it doesn't look good. Learn to make a C and, and like that. So here, what? You see what I mean? And it looks better in a Tibetan, to a Tibetan. You see what I mean? It should come down a little lower. Okay, like that. The written vowels, the vowels that have symbols, have their own names and you have to learn them. Okay? The, the name for this vowel is Giku. Wait now, which is the vowel at top level? This thing we added on the top. Okay. Okay, I'll do it again. That by itself is Ka. That is Ki. Changes to Ki. So the sound of Giku is an E sound. We transcribe it with I. You see what I mean? So this would be key. Key. That's kind of ugly. Let me see if I can get a good one. I don't draw these very much. Nope. That's a good one. Okay. I mean, I'm used to the, the, uh, the script would be... That's the script. Okay. Once you get used to the script, you just do that. Yeah. So we're going to Jorlok, okay? You have to teach your students Jorlok. Jorlok means spelling out loud, okay? C-A-T, cat. If you're in the Cerame school, C-A-T, cat. You know? <laughs> okay, you hear Jorlok. They love to Jorlok. It's very Tibetan. Tibetans love rote and doing things. You can, they can Jorlok a whole paragraph of English and have no idea what it means, you know what I mean? Uh, say, ka, ka. Giku, giku, ki. ki. And that's Jorlo. That's C-A-T, cat. Okay? Say, ka, ka. Giku, giku, ki. ki. Okay? That's all. I'm giving them to you in alphabetical order. In a dictionary, you will find it under ka first. The next row, the next bunch will be ki. You see what I mean? A comes before E in, in English vowels, okay, alphabetically. The next vowel is called Shapkyu. And you draw it like this, two down strokes, right? You don't go like this, all right? You go, you see what I mean? But it should look like that. Let's, I'll keep doing one until I get it right, until I get it pretty. It but... Yeah, it attaches to the bottom of the... No, I went too far. No, something like that, okay? And make a pretty one. That's, that's pretty good. Something like that, okay? Shop is the honorific for foot. 
or leg. Q means a hook. We were talking about the chakyu I got from, well, I won't mention, the abbot of my monastery called last night and tried to put a chakyu. Chak means iron. Q means hook. Chakyu means, would you like to help us with... Okay. <laughs> Say, shepkyu. How do you jaw lock it? Ka? Shepkyu. Ku. Okay. Ka? Shepkyu. Ku. All right, that's easy. Next one, alpha, you know, in, in alphabetical order. Next one's just a straight line like that. Okay. And it's called Dengbu. Do we all have the dot? Yeah. You have to always use the dot. Never draw a letter without a dot on it. It looks tacky. Every letter has a dot. Yeah, there's a few exceptions that we'll get to. Do you know that thing at Iwo Jima? That picture of the guys raising the flag, and they're halfway up, and the flag is like this? That's the meaning of Deng. Deng in Tibetan means to raise a flag up like that. Um, and Bu just means a mark or something. So Deng Bu is like a halfway up flag mark. The name has meaning. But this is called a dengbu, okay? And there's what it looks like. This is an A sound. It's literally this in Tibetan, in English, K, right? I use the E to represent that. So say, ka, ka. dengbu, ke. ke. Okay, ka, ka. dengbu, ke. 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 That's all. Easy. The name is a little hard. This is a uh, retroflex, da. We didn't get to it yet. We'll get there, okay? I'm not going to teach it to you yet. Okay, we go on to the last vowel, which is... You got that natural one, okay? Okay, good question. There's good questions and bad questions. <laughs> Or intelligent questions and unintelligent questions. That's an intelligent question. Okay. The name of this vowel is uh, naro. Say naro. 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 The word has something to do with bull horns, probably. Okay. And you see why. I think of it as a seagull. Yeah. And uh, it's pretty somehow. This is a little too long. And the pronunciation is like that. Are you getting the board well? Good. Say ka, ka naro, naro, ko. Ko. Ka, ka, naro, naro, ko. ko. So if you tell your student, jaw lock it, they gotta go, ka, naro, ko. You say read it, they say ko. Okay. We finished all the vowels. Easy. Head letters. There are three in Tibetan. Ra, la, and sa. So if you have a ka, and it gets a head letter stuck on it, it shrinks a bit. Okay, watch. Okay, those are real. I mean, this should be a little longer, right? This is a normal size ka, and when a ka gets a le head letter, it gets like this. Notice that the head letter does not rise above the, what do you call that in typography, Mark? I don't know. The header line or something like that. It doesn't go above the line. It's down below the, the line. Okay. Some people try to draw it above the line. Okay. Why do they add head letters? Mainly for orthographic purposes. When I learned all this stuff, I learned it from a Greek scholar. I mean, all this linguistic junk. It makes you sound very scholarly. For spelling purposes, okay? Ka with a head letter on it doesn't mean the same thing as ka without a head letter on it. 
although they are pronounced the same in the case of the first column. That's another reason to learn things in columns, you see? Rules are different for first column than they are for third column. That's another reason to teach your students everything in terms of columns first. Okay? The rules for head letters on the first column are different from the rules of head letters on third columns. And that's the point. Okay? And we'll talk about it. By the way, when you add a ra, well, let's do a sa first. Okay? And the dot goes here, right? So it's like, goes up here. Here's a real size sa, okay? Got it? You see what I mean? The sa shrinks and the ka shrinks. When you, when you attach a ra head letter, you chop it off first. Tick, 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 tick. So when you attach a ra to a, 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 to a ka, it looks like this. You see what I mean? With almost every letter, that's a mayingak. What's a mayingak mean? It means they're exceptions, <laughs> okay? When I say almost every letter, it gets chopped off. I, I believe uh, with nya, you know, you'll see it like that or something. I don't remember which one it is. I think it's nya. Anyway, you'll see it. Okay. I'm going to go over that now. Okay, but first I want you to just see how you attach them. Okay. Here are the rules for the effect of a head letter per column. Okay? If you don't learn things in column, you're in trouble. You have to teach things in columns first. Here are the rules. Very simple, three rules. Got it? First rule. When you put a head letter on top of a first column letter, nothing happens to the pronunciation at all. Nothing happens. That's nice. So pronounce this one. Pronounce this one. Pronounce this one. Easy. Okay? Ka, ka, ka. All the same. Probably in ancient Tibet they said ka, la, ka, suka. But they don't do that anymore. Okay? That causes a problem, by the way, when Tibetans try to pronounce Sanskrit, which is written in their letters, because they just drop them. Samskara becomes Sankara. You see, because they're used to dropping the head letter. Okay? And you get some mispronunciation of Sanskrit that way. Okay? They don't pronounce the head letter, but when they write Sanskrit where that letter is pronounced, they drop the head letter. So instead of saying Samskara, they would say Sankara. You see what I mean? Um, the rule for a head letter on the second column is really nice. They never go on second column letters. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right? I think you can pronounce that. <laughs> There's an exception. I don't know exactly how to spell this, but I think it would look something like, like this. This is Sanskrit, you see? Artha. Artha. And then, and then it's pronounced. Okay? Artha. Something like that. So in Sanskrit, you can see that, a second column with a head letter on it. But it's not normal Tibetan, so throw that out. Okay. The only time a second column letter might get a head letter is in Sanskrit. Sanskrit written in Tibetan letters, which you're not going to run into very common often. Okay. Third column is very tricky. What is the third column? You tell me. You can do it now. Yeah, and then do it. Ka. Cha, ta, pa, sa, sorry, nya, sa, okay. When they get a head letter, they lose their aspiration, okay? I'll show you what's the difference. Let's give them a sa, okay? Uh, let's, let's give them something real.
we'll make up, this is what linguists do, they make up little signs, okay? This is going to be Brazil, okay? Ka. All right? Ka. Okay? When you put a head letter on a third column, it becomes the real English sound. Easy. So this is the G in God. You see what I mean? If it didn't have a head letter, it would be God. You get it? Okay? This is Ga. This is Ka. Okay? Ga. Ka. Alright? This is the hardest thing for, for Westerners. And this is where they're this is where you choose the you separate the men from the boys in pronunciation. Do they get it or not? Okay? Without the head letter? Ka. With the head letter? Ga. Ga. And we do have these sounds in English. Okay? We do have all these sounds in English. So this becomes this is ja. And this is J as in job. Okay. Ja, okay? Cha, ja, cha, ja. If you cannot distinguish these two sounds in your mind, your Tibetan will always be lousy, and you'll never be able to read scripture, because it'll all sound the same to you. Well, if I'm thing. You see, if I do it in English, you can't, it doesn't, you see? If I do the same thing with English, you can't even understand the English. You see, I mean, I do because I almost smoke. You see, you got to distinguish between these two. Okay, it's getting easy, right? Da. Da as in dog. What's that? Ta. Say ta. Da. Ta. Da. Okay. I remind you that this isn't the same as the second column, which was ta, ta. And it's obviously not the same as the first column, which was ta. Okay? <laughs> so I'll go through the three columns. Now we have four, actually. We have three and a half, right? Ta, 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 and da. So when I started out today and it sounded so esoteric, it's getting clear now, right? Ta, the first column, ta. Second column, ta. Third column, da. Fourth column. And they all sound different to you now, right? I hope. Da, ta, da, da. Da, ta, ta, da. Okay? In that first one, it looks like a square under GA and a triangle under G is in God, which is correct. Uh, you'll see it both ways. I suppose this one is a little more correct. How about halfway between? <laughs> that gets me out of the, I'm a debater, okay? And a diamond dealer. <laughs> pa. Pa. Ba. Pa. Ba. Okay? Different, right? As in Zog. I don't know. We don't, we, don't, we don't have any English. I can't think of it. I, maybe you can find one. Zog. Zog. Anyway, I can't think of one. Okay, but you get the point. Za. 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 Got it? We can. You just finished class three. Oh, sorry. No, you didn't. What does it do to fourth column? What was the fourth column? But by the way, there are not six. It's only it's not six. It's only five, right? Na. Ya. Na. I'm sorry, only four. Ma. Okay. Now we'll add a head letter and see what happens to them.
the rule for the fourth column. You see, if you don't learn it in columns, you have to learn like 19 different rules. If you learn it in columns, you can finish it with three rules, right? The fourth column just gets stronger and higher. Stronger and higher. Okay? Remember we made a big deal about saying the fourth column low? Now they're getting high. Okay? Say, nga. 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 Stronger. Not really, it's not a tone thing. I'm nothing like, nga. It's not like that. It's just stronger, you know? And when you hear a Tibetan, it's very subtle. It's nga and nga. You see? Nga and nga. Okay? Nga. 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 Nya. 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 Ma. 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 That's all. Some kind of emphasis. Do we use emphasis in English? We sure do. If you don't think so, you know what I mean? We, use, we say the same words, meaning you better watch your ass. You know what I mean? Like, you give them some emphasis. You see, it's emphasis. And they take on a totally different meaning, right? Uh, for example, here, nga means I. Nga means before. Na means if. Na means your nose. You see, and you don't want to go mistaking them. Most Americans or most Westerners will say this row too high, in, rather than the opposite problem. You see what I mean? It's not that they fail to make this high. It's that they make this is just as high as that. Okay? And you have to watch out for that. When you teach your students, make them do the nasal column low. So keep it down low. Okay? Na, nya, na, ma. Na, nya, na, ma. Okay? I don't think any other letters take head letters. How's that? Don't think any other letters take head letters. I mean, there may be one exception or something, but we won't worry about it. Okay? That finishes class three. We'll go to class four. <laughs>